Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Hey, welcome, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. We're going to have fun this morning. Okay, in church. Fun is going to be, we're going to do some practical application and some ministry. So get ready to be called up front. Uh oh, I heard uh oh in there. <laughs> uh, hey, that's part of the fun. Uh, want to uh, greet, we have some visitors. We have uh, Catherine Bell and Dottie, and shared a wonderful testimony of how the, she's working from another church in the 60-day challenge with some people uh, that uh, are benefiting from it. And we're in the process here at uh, Kingdom Life Church, Full Stature Ministries. We are doing the Peace Challenge. That's the next step after the 60-day challenge, there's a 60-day peace challenge. I don't recommend the peace challenge unless you learn how to do the basics first, and that's how to deal with negative emotions. If you don't know how to bring those to Jesus, the peace challenge will be very frustrating. So anyway, I don't want anybody frustrated. Frustration means that you're not trusting God. You cannot be stressed and trusting God at the same time. That's a spiritual impossibility. But today, uh, uh, no matter how well my people know this, uh, I, I want to remind people out there that are watching, there's always more watching than there are in the room, uh, that we have the Power of Peace 60-day uh, challenge journal that you can fill out and keep track of yourself, whether it's at the end of the day or the previous day, and how did I do? Did I put up walls? when other people were talking or did or did I release love to them you know did I have peace before I made a decision or do I just decision, make decisions because it's it's expedient that I do it quick yeah no that's not good did Jesus rule during the day to what percentage did he rule during the day all day did the peace of God rule all day or did you lose your peace if you lost your peace did you get back there quickly those are the kinds of things. And believe it or not, it's like a muscle. Practice makes permanent. And, and you get more and more proficient to the degree that you practice it. Also, we have the, the paperback book, The Supernatural Power of Peace. And uh, our publisher was uh, very pleased with this because he said it's, it's just peace has looked upon as passive, almost unnecessary, when they fail to understand that it's, it's the supernatural power to abide he himself is your peace. It's Jesus. You can't minimize that. Now, I'm going to have fun this morning because uh, uh, I'm going to do a little troubleshooting, a little ministry with people. And uh, so uh, if you got nervous when I said that, I'm going to call people forward, drop down, let it go. God, I'm yours, whatever. Right? Isn't that the proper response? Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> as we begin, uh, how to get started, uh, we have a, through years when Jennifer and I traveled, 12 to be exact, uh, church to church, uh, we had a troubleshooting, repetitive little booklet that helped people because we saw the same mistakes. You know, we're not that original, you know, <laughs> if we make a mistake, in presencing God, it's, it's, it's pretty much across the board, people doing it the same way. Uh, and getting started, we use this one scripture that's been very beneficial. It's in the message paraphrase translation. Um, and it says, we know it as the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imagination, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. But listen to that in the message. We use our powerful God tools. Oh, I just love that. God tools. That's we. That means you and I. We use our powerful God tools. So there, that means, uh, just as it says, uh, 
it brings every loose thought, emotion, and impulse. Now notice where I put impulse. Your will is here. Your will is not here. This is where you give consent. But the will, the door of the heart, is down here. This is where you either open or close. And we're going to get into some troubleshooting today to make sure that you're walking in the spirit and not the flesh. Right? If you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. So let's teach you to walk in the spirit properly. Um, it says our tools, the first of all, we realize these God tools, they take thoughts, emotions, and impulses, mind, will, and emotions, and they put them together under the authority of Jesus into a structure that's been shaped by Christ. That means every time you do something right, there's a little droplet of anointing, little droplet of the divine nature of Jesus himself that is permanently residing and abiding and dwelling in you. Isn't that nice to know? I don't know about you, but I want more, right? It's like the virgins, the, the lamp of the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, but the filling up of the extra oil requires the mind, will, and the emotions to be touched by the Spirit of God. Some of them got saved, and that's about it. They quit. They did not really move forward. Wasn't much, not, their lamps didn't have much oil, right? You can't just get by on a salvation experience and never progress. If you're not moving forward, you're moving backward. It's, it's that simple. Now, in getting started, it says, uh, our tools are ready and, and at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building lives of obedience unto maturity. To build a life unto maturity, we have to realize these God tools are ready and they're at hand. We don't really have an excuse. You have to learn how to apply and lay hold of these God tools. They're ready, they're at hand. And uh, this morning in our uh, intercession, there was a, a lot of words about um, uh, the landscape and change of the landscape. We heard it again and again this morning uh, as intercessors, and they just about hit my message because the title of this message is How to Dismantle a House of Thoughts. There's a long title for you, but that's the message for today. How to Dismantle a House of Thoughts. Now, we know when you're getting started, uh, for this to work, obviously, a life in the Spirit, you've got to be born again first. Believe it or not, uh, we always had people go, I learned what you're teaching, Dennis and Jennifer. I learned this. Will this work on my unsaved family? No. Sanctification means it's a work of Jesus. They have to have Jesus in them. Jesus is doing the work. It's not a method or a formula. Mistake number one. If you're asking the question, Will this work with unsaved people, emotional healing? You're missing the point. The emotional healing we're talking about are God tools, and they come from God. <laughs> and they're not coming from outside the person. However, uh, we did businesses before when we travel. Remember, they would set us appointments. So we did a brokerage firm. We did dentist office. Uh, and in the brokerage firm, they would send us people, and they weren't saved. I'm going, you know. Uh, to remove bottlenecks in the business. And the funny thing is, is, you'd think we were evangelists or something because everybody we had that wasn't saved got saved across the board. But here's what we did. We said, well, uh, we're here for emotional healing and uh, to remove any bottlenecks in your interpersonal relationships at, on the job and what have you. Uh, however, uh, Jesus works from the inside out. Would you care to invite him in? And I was like, yeah, if I can get emotionally healed by inviting Jesus into my life, life goes good. And sure enough, they all wanted, they were emotional wrecks. You know what? The solution in the world is Jesus, isn't it? I mean, really, there is no other solution. Would you like to invite him in? Because he works from the inside out. See, a lot of people want something done to them that requires no effort on their part. And the church has been known for that. It's kind of a... Uh, makes you dependent. Well, we teach here even deliverance, self-deliverance. We teach you how to go to Jesus, the deliverer in you. All right. So we're, we're flip-flopping here. We, we don't care how it's been done. 
in the past. As a matter of fact, I want to correct some of this stuff before we even start because I hear it again. So if you're going to get started with this and you're going to walk a supernatural life, you're going to have to be born again first. Uh, don't minister to unbelievers except to get, get them born again. Uh, prayer ministry is a work of the cross and the Holy Spirit. It's not a counseling method. And one of the most common mistakes we saw when we traveled church to church, um, especially if they were prophetically oriented, they were very visual, but visual in the wrong way. Uh, we don't use uh, visualization in the sense of, here's what we saw happening. Uh, in some cases, there were altar calls where they would say, how many of you have been rejected severely growing up, blah, blah, blah. And you'd have people crying. Say maybe there's a thousand people. You'd have people crying. You'd have them come to the altar. Now, why were they crying when they were talking about rejection? Because they could feel and relive a portion of that hurt. It's still there. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. You bring it to the forefront, and they felt it. Come forward to the altar now. Lift up your hands and worship God. And you do that long enough, and while you're worshiping God, the feelings change. That is not ministry. That is changing the subject. So we used to do, we used to do introductory teachings where we would say, just to show you how easy it is to do it wrong even, Let's close your eyes. Think of a wonderful vacation you just had recently or a wonderful time that you just had, whether it was with someone or by yourself. Oh, doesn't that feel good? Now think of a, think of a crisis. Think of something that was your worst nightmare. How does that feel? Creepy. So if I say, well, then here's what we saw happening over the years. We saw people with, a, with a, an emotional healing model that was nothing more than changing the picture. It was not a work of the cross. It was not sanctification. It was changing the subject. You know those people that came forward that felt better after they worshiped? Do you know when they went home, if you mentioned about the rejection that they had, the pain still be there if they talked about it. Only Jesus can take the pain and the sorrow but it has to be given to him, and the only true positive is the cross. The cross is the only true positive in dealing with any issue. Because even John Bevere had that book, right? Good isn't always God. So it's not about good or evil. It's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but that's not the solution. The solution's in the cross of Jesus, and you can't bypass that under any circumstances. So what we saw was... Um, uh, and we never do this and, and make sure because we've seen people, this is one of the most common mistakes for even learning our material. The most common mistake is, close your eyes, first person or situation. You know, the goal is if I see this horrible person who damaged my entire family and I see their face and down here there's yuck, I don't see... Oh, I see Jesus hugging him. Oh, now I feel better. That's not the cross. That is not ministry. You'd be surprised how many people have done that because they momentarily feel better. Why? They saw Jesus. Well, I feel good when I see Jesus too. But at the same time, that is not sanctification. It's very dangerous to do that. You're, you're making it a lie. That's not real. Was he there? Theoretically, sure. God is omnipresent. But the point is, true sanctification, a true work of the cross is, I see that, uh, that person that was so horrible to me, I feel the yuck, and then I let from my spirit, I let forgiveness flow, because only Jesus can take my pain and sorrow. And when it changes to peace or the pain, the sorrow, the rejection is gone. And I can still see that ugly. I don't change the situation. I see that ugly. I'm facing my fear. I'm facing the ugly situation. But I'm also aware that in my spirit, God just took it away and washed it away. It's like salvation. You felt guilt. 
You come to the altar, you receive Jesus, and it changes to peace. You've made your peace with God. Without the peace, nothing happened. It's not just about seeing in your head the right answer. You can see the right answer and have none effect. I hope this is clear because we can save a lot of people a lot of aggravation who think they're doing ministry and they're really just changing the picture. They're just changing it and making it more pe pleasant. No. When we had that bishop uh, in, down in Alabama, Montgomery, Alabama, these were his words after he sat in our seminar for two, two months. I mean two months, two evenings. He says, from the initial encounter with Christ, that's your born-again experience, and the subsequent process of relationship that follows, that's a walk in the Spirit or walking it out. Pastor Dennis and Jen have documented a step-by-step -step explanation, step-by-step -step explanation that combines God encounter with the process. The process of sanctification. It's spirit, spirit, spirit. This is not a head thing. This is not something that you, you can just do in your own natural strength. It is a descriptive approach that demystifies how to live in the spirit, and it's based on a simplicity of a relationship with Jesus. It's got to be heart to heart, spirit to spirit. So, uh, we are just helping people receive ministry directly from the Holy Spirit. We don't use this guided imagery, old-fashioned inner healing techniques or anything else. Uh, we do not minister to them. We teach them how to properly go to the Jesus in them. Now, if I have my choice, I'd want someone to just do it to me. It's far more preferable than me actually applying myself. But unfortunately, God says to work out your salvation, for it is God who is at work both to will and to perform for his good pleasure. So, number one rule, and I'm going to have Connie come up here. Don't be nervous. You can't make a mistake, all right? One of the first things to do is to teach them to close their eyes. For some reason, when people close their eyes, at least there's a better attempt that they actually go to their spirit. But close your eyes and think of something very pleasant. How does it feel right there, down here? Feels good. Think of something that's not very pleasant. And I can even bear witness to that. That's not pleasant, whatever you're thinking of. Now, open your eyes. The thing that was not pleasant, it's still in there. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive, and until you present them to Jesus, it didn't go anywhere. So let's deal with that, okay? Close your eyes. Picture the unpleasant. Now remember, you're, you're picturing the unpleasant exactly as ugly as it is. You're not changing it. That's a bad, bad, bad thing to do. Feel the feeling. Now let. This is where you let out of my belly flows, rivers. It, the, the, the rivers that flow out of your belly do not have to come out of your mouth. There, she just did it. Am I right? I could feel the anointing flow. So whatever you just did, there's an anointing on it that is permanent. That 10 years from now, say, close your eyes, picture that ugly situation you did back in church. And that feeling will be the same. It'll be the peace of God. The absence of is a way to look at it even. Because sometimes peace feels like nothing, but compared to rejection, hurt, anger, fear, lust, guilt, shame, wouldn't you rather feel nothing? Well, that's a sign that Jesus took it, and he took it away in Jesus' name. Now, the way I learned this 
was because from the time I got filled with the Spirit, discerning the human spirit was as easy as breathing for me. So what I found out were people were saying the right answers, but I could discern that it wasn't happening. Like, I love my mother, because they're giving the right religious answer. But down here it was going, eh. Would you call that a contradiction? If you say, I love my mother, that's the right religious answer, but it's not really what's taking place in you. You want that to change. And you release forgiveness to the mother. That's it, like that. It will just be flowing until it's peace. Peace will not lie. God will not put his peace on a lie. He will not. You can't make it happen. You can't make righteousness, peace, or joy. It's the fruit of the Spirit, and it comes out of a genuine heart-to-heart, -heart, spirit to spirit relationship with Him. Okay. You can go sit and relax now. We might do some more here. I'll pick on somebody else for you, though. She don't mind. Number one rule. And the title of this message is, and especially in light of the prayer we had this morning about changing the landscape over and over again, we heard that. This is dismantling the house of thoughts. <clears throat> dismantling the house of thoughts. And <clears throat> understanding this is important because um, in my first pastorate, uh, before I built the building, there's pictures in the bookstore on, on, this, on that building. It was a dome structure that was added to a two-story building, uh, a large uh, two-story building. But out in the, it was a former campground. We purchased for the church a former campground, uh, a Pentecostal campground. And they built a wo wooden shed, and they had th those old-fashioned theater seats. It sat a 1,000 people. But it was dilapidated, run down, and the reason I was able to buy it from my church was because the denomination were all supposed to be paying for it and upkeep. And it seemed like the, the one that was local, the church that was local, got stuck with all the work. So they made a big to-do about it and said, let's just sell it. We're, we're stuck with all the upkeep. It's used once a month. They used to have David Wilkerson and some big name old time speakers. Pentecostal speakers would come and, and, and preach there and everything. But it, uh, it was sentimental to them. They, they liked the idea that I was going to do a church there because their children, their grandchildren got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit in that place. And uh, they were crying when they found out that someone wanted to buy it for a church. But dismantling the house of thoughts did you know before you build something, there's a dismantling that may have taken place? And that place was rotten. And I'm going, oh my goodness, that'll cost us a small fortune to get rid of that place. And so I'm praying about it. And all of a sudden, we just realized that we were in Amish country up there in Pennsylvania. We had the Amish come for free and dismantle the building, and they could keep whatever they got from the building. Now, some of the wood was rotten and everything, but there were planks and stuff and cement block. They, they had a field day with all of the good stuff that they could get out of it. The cement block, the panels, wiring, you know, they're extremely resourceful people as far as getting that. They took that thousand seat auditorium, brought it down to nothing. And the only thing that was left was, some, that was the wood that was not salvageable and some of that. And the volunteer fire department right up the street said, we'll burn that up just for practice. We'll burn the foundation up. So, the, this, the topic for me, dismantling of the house of thoughts, I saw the necessary preparation beforehand. And I can prove it scripturally that even when uh, that had to be laid flat before there was and, and became a parking lot, uh, but that had to be laid flat and out of the way without a, a cost, that it was actually redemptive for them. They used that wood. They used that wire. They used it. It was beneficial to them. I used to like to go out and witness to them every day, too, because I'd say, well, I thank God I'm born again. they go, well, I hope so. Uh, yeah, I know I'm born again. they go, well, I hope so. So <laughs> we had a little conflict in our theology, perhaps, but we had fun. Anyway, um, but here's, here's the thing. 
that that structure being torn down before the building could then be further uh, applied. Scripturally, the Lord taught me that many, many years ago, that, uh, <clears throat> that that was a very important part of understanding uh, in Jeremiah 1. He said, Jeremiah, as a prophet, I'm going to put my words in your mouth. And these words are going to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, then build and plant. And if that's the way the Word of God worked in the prophet's mouth, the structure is very similar to the way God wants to build in our lives. He can't just build and plant. There's some dismantling that needs to take place. There's some clearing of the ground that needs to take place. And so uh, the, the first thing that we would teach somebody is saying, in understanding that process, we have to start with the number one area where we saw mistakes. Location, location, location. I was shocked. We would say things like this. We were in churches of a thousand people and we would see 99% of them doing it wrong. What would, wouldn't you say that then that needs to be repeated no matter how many times my people have know, know better. Apparently, church-wide, they needed the repetition. We would say, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Quick, point to Jesus. 98% of the church pointed to heaven. That's deceptive distance that is not necessary. Yes, he's in heaven. Christ in you, the hope of glory. There's going to have to be a mindset change. You're going to have to get a little bit more, uh, as uh, Kenneth Copeland used to teach it, God inside minded. <laughs> I don't care how you say it. You're going to have to be a little bit more aware of Jesus in you and not just see him far, far away. Distance is a deception. So in location, isn't that the number one rule in real estate? Location, 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 or at least they say it is. Um, but uh, in, for effective Christian living, location is essential. I'm going to have uh, Lisa come up. And I'm going to do location, and I always wanted to do this on video because if you explain it, people still can do it wrong. Location, number one, your thoughts. This is the only one you should know. Up here. The seat of the emotions. The will. This, that fools 97% of your Christians, the will. They think the will's up here. No, you consent. But when you read those psalm and songs of old, surrender all, I surrender, surrender is here. So here's how we even prove surrender is here. And they even do this in the, in the flesh. They do this in the, like little camps. To get your confidence, I'll stand behind you and you fall backwards into my hand. You have to let go down here to go backwards. Even though, there you go. To even do that, they call it, of course, in, in, in the camp or something, they'll call that trust. All right. But the point is, do you see that to fall backwards, you have to yield here. It's not something you want to do. Why? Well, because we don't want to be in control. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, S scratch that part. All right. But what happens if you don't fall back, but you yield here to Jesus? She's doing it right now. Peace. Let the peace of God rule. If he's going to rule, he's got to rule your will, and you can't be thinking that your will is here. Consent, yield, obey. CYO. Consent is the only thing that happens up here. Okay, I'm going to do what he's saying. Down here, uh, I guess I got to let it go. I got to let go or I'm not falling backwards. He'll know. He'll know I didn't let go if I don't fall backwards. <laughs> so you can say up here, yes, Dennis, I, I will fall backwards. <laughs> and then you don't fall backwards. You ain't fooling this. You didn't surrender. You didn't yield. You didn't allow. 
We use that word allow. Why allow? Because this is also, I stand at the door of your heart. Jesus did not stand and knock on your head. He, this is where he wanted to come in. When you got born again, he came into your spirit. The door of the heart is right where she's got her hands. And you can either open or shut. Okay. So now Lisa and I are walking through the store. And uh, we're picking up some items for the church. And all of a sudden there's this evil person who hates Christians coming down. And we both know the person. We have a choice of either doing yield to Jesus within or do what 99.9% .9 of Christians do. They go like this. Come on, look at me. <laughs> you know what that is. You tighten your gut like, uh-oh. You, know you know in that tightening of the gut what you just did? You just cut Jesus out and said, I'm going to take care of me. I'm into self-preservation right now, and those people are mean, and they might say something mean to me, so I'm going to protect myself. Well, guess what? When you close the door of your heart, you cut Jesus out. That's fear. That's a fear door. And guess what? It's like invisible to demons. Demons can go right through that door. They can harass that door. Flesh can get right through there, and you get, you get slimed. If that person says something evil, and you have your, your protective wall up that's not God, flesh wall, anything they say goes right through there and you get slimed. Mm -hmm. And emotions don't die, they get buried alive. Location, location, location. Where's the seat of the emotions? Where's the will? Better known as the door of the heart. Where's your thoughts? Oh, okay, <laughs> we got... Uh, you can't go... You can, should at least get that one right, all right? However, when David said in Psalm 9, search me, O God, for secret faults. Whoa, that's the non-conscious. You're going to have to open the door of your heart and say, God, search me. I don't know. Oh, I'm going to have to let God do the searching. Oh, how many billion, Jennifer? Per second. Per second, there are 400 billion thought processes going on in the non-conscious. Do you think you're smart enough to figure God out and what you ought to deal with and what to tell God what you're going to deal with and what you're not going to deal with? Do like David. Search me, O God, for secret faults. Who are they secret from? David! That's an act of humility that can produce a positive Christian walk. Humble yourself a little bit. You don't know all the answers. You don't know how to figure things out. And the most people that struggle the longest, even Christians that have learned to do this, if you overly think, you just prolong the agony. Mm -hmm. Overly thinking will not accomplish anything. You don't have to figure it out. You have to have a childlike, simple trust in Jesus in you. And you would get much further. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now... Thoughts, emotions, will, door of the heart. I think we're good for now. You can go sit down. You did perfect. Do you understand the will is here? So what, what do I do if that hostile, demonic person's coming down the aisle in the grocery store? If I don't protect myself, what do I do? You go, you go to the only one that can protect you, Jesus, here they come, Jesus, and you relax, you yield the abdominal muscle, it's one way to say, I don't know how else to explain, it's subjective, but you yield and relax to the Jesus in you. It is God who is at work to will and to perform, but it requires you to let go. So you let go does not mean you're going to get poisoned by all their junk. It's just the opposite. If you don't have Jesus, you will. <laughs> But if you've got Jesus, you've got peace. Peace, what the scripture says, guard your heart and your mind. That is not poetry. You just haven't tried it enough. You, you're so much in control of your own choices that you don't realize how much God could protect you if you let him. So here comes that evil person that's going to come and yell at me. They're coming my way. There's no escape. <laughs> I'm going to Jesus, well, which is, by the way, your escape. I go to Jesus and I let the peace
guard my heart and my mind. And that person says all kinds of horrific evil stuff. And evil cannot penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. It's an absolute impossibility to penetrate the fruit of the Spirit. The peace of God will crush Satan beneath your feet. The shoes of peace. You should be walking in the Spirit, not according to the flesh, and you would walk a victorious life. But don't do I even I even had a I even had a pastor of, of a large large church come and did it wrong because he had prophetic training and he didn't mean to but he, it's a mistake. Don't the visualization speaks of potential. Um, he said uh, I'm going to visit my father in Kentucky and he says and He's older now, but you know, he said, we've never seen eye to eye. It's always been very, very painful. And there's always been a distance between the two of us. And he said, so I'm coming down uh, Charlotte for a conference, and I wonder if we could set up an appointment. I said, okay, we set up an appointment. Within 10 minutes, here's the first thing he did. I said, okay, close your eyes. Now, I knew he was coming down to deal with his father before he went to Kentucky. First thing he said, I see... Uh, water, living water behind a wall. I said, okay, put the, heal, the healing waters and the wall on a shelf right now. Which prophetically, it was accurate. It's what he needed. But you don't get healed with potential. Potential, no matter how accurate it is, means that could happen, but it's not happening just because you see it. Major mistake. Major. Failing to understand potential from actually doing it. And that's where some of those old inner healing models made the mistake. Oh, I see Jesus hugging me. I feel so much better now. I'm done. Oh, hugging you for what? A molestation? Well, guess what? You think of that molestation apart from that hugging experience, and it's still there. You can't just see it and say it different, change the scenario, and suddenly it's gone. It's momentary. Emotions don't die. They get buried alive. No. If, if, if God is, is dealing with that and he's teaching us how to let the peace of God guard our heart and our mind, how then do we dismantle this house of... And they are house of thoughts. It's a house of thought. You've got a house of thoughts in various areas toward yourself, toward God, toward life in general, toward other people. It's a house of thoughts. It's a structure. And I'm telling you, we're going to have to clear the landscape. It's going to be time to root out. And interesting, in Jeremiah, it alternates in that scripture, in Jeremiah 1, it alternates between planting and building. Root out evil. That's the ground, right? Get rid of the weeds. Root out. Pull down. That's strongholds. The building's got to come down before we can build or plant. Then it says, destroy and actually it was interesting you do a word study on that word destroy and it had to do with destroy the ground that you rooted out and it's kind of like weed and feed was the concept it's like you destroy it for evil to grow there anymore you've cleansed it you've cleansed the ground you haven't planted nothing yet but you've cleansed it it's free from the weeds and you've cleansed it you destroyed it then it says throw down well, those structures that you pulled on, it wouldn't have been enough for me to just pull that barn down that was on the, my church property. It had to be lay leveled out. It had to be thrown down so that you can build something on top of it. Then the scripture says, then you can, after you have root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, build plant. And I'm telling you, you want to change the landscape, you, there's no short circuit. You can say all the right answers, you can pray all the right prayers, but until you deal with the dismantling of the strongholds in you, you're not going to be very effective with the strongholds around you. You've got to win the battle within before you're going to win the battle without. So, 1st thing you can do is you can... Do that little model if you're watching by YouTube. Do that little thing to where you just learn to realize that this is where the will is. This is the seat of the emotions. This is the door of the heart. 
everything for the most part happens here. And if you get a lie that is contrary to the word of God, to bring that thought captive to Christ, it goes from here to here. But it won't go from here to here until you deal with the power behind it. By the way, we talk about for yielding, we use the term drop down. And when we say drop down, we mean to sink into in order to be clothed. And duo is the Greek word. Our Bibles don't say drop down. Our Bibles say put on. But put on in the Greek is enduo, to sink into in order to be clothed. Just like baptism. You have to sink into the element to be totally clothed and encompassed with the, with the uh, immersion. <coughs> so, <coughs> here's the other thing. In that yielding, if we would understand that one of the most important, powerful lessons you can learn is learning how to yield, you will continue to struggle in many areas of your life unless you learn to yield. We live by dying, we fight by surrendering. And it's, it's did I say that right? Or is it the reverse? Either way, it, it works. No, we, we do, we live by dying, we fight by yielding. You yield, then God is at work in you to both will and to perform. He said both, both Philippians to, to will and to work. And that follows right after it says, work out your salvation of fear and trembling. So I'm supposed to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, but then it's God who is at work in me to will and perform. Somehow I've got to balance that out into a practical, real life experience. Now, the... Uh, the most powerful lesson is realizing when you don't yield, you're left to your own resources. Good luck. But when you yield and connect with God, God works. And I still remember that uh, Anna, she's with the Lord now, but she was a, a Yale uh, professor who came down here and was going to put black paper on the windows so that no one else would come because she thought this was the happiest, healthiest family she was ever in. And she didn't want to share. <laughs> Need a ministry on that. <laughs> but, but it was cute the way she said it. She says, what you're, what you're saying, I get it, I get it. The light bulb went on. For her it was, it is, if it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, that suggests it's no longer I who forgive, but Christ who forgives through me. It's no longer I who love but Christ who loves through me. And all of that is scriptural because it's the new creation reality that has to do it. You can't function apart from God. Apart from me, you can do nothing, but I can do all things through Christ. So the goal then is learning to do it through Christ and not apart from him just because it's the right answer. Oh, did we see people suffer when we went church to church who knew the right biblical answer and had, didn't have a clue on how to apply it to real life. That is still the missing ingredient, how to. And matter of fact, on Tuesdays, um, we have a, a one-hour meeting, seven, learning how to uh, train your senses to be exercised, to discern, see, hear, touch. And uh, everybody shares in that experience. But I'm going to start a half hour early, and I'm going to do troubleshooting with people and walk them through certain things to make sure that they don't mess up and start doing it wrong, doing it wrong and be the right answer without the spirit. <laughs> so 6.30 to 7 probably. I only need about a half hour to troubleshoot and make sure that people, and do like I did with Lisa. I can feel when, when you're doing it right and I can feel when you're not doing it right. But you don't have to have that gift. The point is, guess what? What God showed me was, yes, Dennis, that helped you learn to go from the initial encounter to the subsequent relationship and to teach people the steps. However, everybody doesn't need a gift to know what's going on in them. You're going to stand before Jesus for the life that you live, and that means starting by being responsible of what's going on in me. I'm responsible for that. The blame game's done. 
You were born again. Blame doesn't work anymore. And forgiveness has to flow toward God's self or others. And, and it sounds kind of like bad theology to forgive God. He didn't do anything wrong. But you have done plenty wrong by judging God for not doing it your way. You need to release that demand you made on him. <coughs> so... <coughs> Who wants to practice yielding? Anybody? Let me let me have. Uh, I want Nathan. I'll take Nathan. <clears throat> now we have Nathan, Spencer, Dottie, and Catherine visiting with us. So you guys better get this right. <laughs> All right. Put your hand here. Now, yield by falling back a little bit. Yeah. Can you feel a change where your hand is? I can feel a shift. Yeah. A shift. That's a good way to explain it. Yielding. See, once you have your own subjective experience, you, don't, you could read 20 books on it and not understand what anybody's talking about. Once you have your own subjective experience, that's why I want to do Tuesdays a half hour. I want them to have their own no-so so they don't have to try to figure out what you mean when you read a book. Now, yield without falling back. That's a, it just increased just there. It increased that. That's peace, but that's not an it. That peace is Jesus. That's your Jesus. And he nodded his head yes, but in here he did the same thing. It was like there was an inner yes, wasn't there? That inner yes is assurance. God, we labor with Christians who don't know the have the assurance of their salvation experience. They keep going and get saved over and over and over again. If you knew what that assurance was, that assurance is an inner yes. It's an inner yes. Even if you don't understand the inner yes, it's still saying, mm, because this is where you also get to know. Like, you going to do drugs? No. All right. That, does that no match? No, I'm not doing drugs. No, no. I mean, stay away from it. If you get a no on the inside, obey the no. Life will go good. <laughs> it's not that hard. Just say no to the no. I mean, no, say yes to the no. <laughs> but do you see how important it is? This subjective experience that he's got right now, he'll take with them the rest of his life. He won't need me or some Joe Heavy speaker to minister to him. He will know how to go to the Jesus in him. Well, let's, let's, let's do a whole emotional healing. To heal any emotional area in our life, you have to start with the emotion. And now even secular biology teaches emocognition, emovolition. Remember our initial scripture? The God tools to bring every loose thought, emotion, and impulse or will, choice, into a life structured by Jesus. All right? But emocognition, emo volition means there is a negative or a positive emotion behind every thought. And we're talking today about dismantling a house of thoughts. Guess where we got to start? We got to start with a time bomb emotional time bombs and we got to get rid of them otherwise we're we're just going to hurt ourselves all right so the first person or situation that you see up here nod your head can you say the person's name or there's this person not in particular okay all right but you see a person Okay, what's the feeling? Every thought, I don't care who you are, don't argue with me, every thought has a corresponding emotion. Every thought has a corresponding emotion. What's the emotion here? What's the feeling? If you have trouble naming an emotion, what is it not? 
It's not peace, not joy. Yeah, pretty, pretty much uh, all of them above. No, we're looking for the negative. What would the negative be? Um, most likely resentment. Okay. Now let Jesus, the forgiver, this is where you both do it. You're a born-again believer, so it's Jesus, the forgiver, in you. Let. Remember, open the door. Don't try. Relax. It's almost like it. Like, there you go. Let go. Let go. Let. Jesus, the forgiver, go to that resentment and right through that resentment, let him carry it away while you picture that person. Only picture the person. Don't picture him carrying it away. You feel it going away. Nod your head when it's gone. And I could bear witness to that. Very good. Very good. You can sit down. You see the difference between, and what some people will do is they'll, I see myself forgiving that person. That doesn't work. You have to, like when God taught me this, he taught me, the first person I saw was a, a foreman at work, and he was snarling. He hated Christians, and I was flaunting it. <laughs> and he was going, and then I felt this, resentment, anger, whatever, down here when I pictured his face. And the Lord had me release forgiveness while I saw the distorted face. You're not facing your pain if you change it. You don't change what you're seeing. I saw him angry and snarling and still release loving forgiveness. And when it was gone, he didn't change. He's still snar snarling. But I had peace and the ugliness went away. To remember something bad without the pain is the goal of forgiveness. To be not, to, oh, I forgot, what pain, what sin? That's a bunch of garbage. I've heard that in the church too. Forgive and forget. God is not an amnesiac. He used past stuff for our instruction, for our equipping to know don't do that again. The only place it gets erased is the heavenly record. This is the heavenly record. This is the historical record. It never gets erased from your mind. You forgive somebody, you can remember the situation without the pain. But where, without the pain means this is the heavenly record down here, and you're clean on the inside. Your spirit's clean. You're washed. The heavenly record says, what? What sin? It's gone. The historical record was, I remember when that happened, but now there's no pain. To remember without the pain is transformation, transaction. I don't know, we have to use a lot of different words, acceptance, assurance. But what really works the best is when you have your own no-so. And you can apply your own word to it because it's a subjective experience. But once you have your own no-so, you and God, spirit to spirit, heart to heart, there's, there's nothing stopping you from advancing in the kingdom of God rapidly, and I mean rapidly. This is so remedial to everybody in this room, but it's not remedial to the hundreds of people that will be watching on YouTube. It is not remedial. As a matter of fact, it's probably going to shake up a whole bunch of their houses, and that's what we want to do. We want to shake the house. We want to dismantle strongholds, structures. Just think, in the Garden of Eden, oh, Adam and Eve, before they sinned, they walked in love, joy, peace. That's what the God emotions. The peace, the, the peace, the love, the joy, the fruit of the Spirit, that's the God emotions. You were made. You were given emotions not to punish you. You were given emotions to be conduits of actually feeling love, joy, peace. Yeah, feeling it. No, no. I got the joy of the Lord. I got the joy of the Lord by faith. Would you want that? I don't want it either. I've seen that though. Uh, just forgive and live with the pain. I've heard pastors say that. Just forgive and live with the pain. That's not forgiveness. I like it. Uh, who was it uh, that just shared recently on Sid about the Azazel? They put their hands on the head of the goat, 
in the Old Testament and send it into the wilderness never to return. That's the way your sin goes. And when you do it properly from here, it doesn't come back. If you say, well, I forgave such and such, and it came back. You didn't do it right. It doesn't come back. As a matter of fact, he even kind of joked. He says he believes that the priests, when they laid hands for the sins of the people and sent the goat out into the wilderness, they made sure that goat didn't come back. <laughs> you don't want to see that goat come wandering back into the village. <laughs> so... Anyway, but Adam and Eve did that. And Adam sinned. His spirit was separated from God. And you know, if you just put a simple chart, memorize it in your head, that the banner over me is love. The kingdom of God is love. All the fruit of the spirit, there's really only one fruit, love. Love, joy, peace, faith, it all comes from the love. His banner over me is love. The kingdom of darkness, the devil's kingdom, is fear. His banner is fear. And it's under that fear is hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. That's the Crayola box full of basics. And guess what? When sin entered, Adam and Eve did all of the negative emotions. They hid. They were afraid. They blamed that woman you gave me. She's the problem. I think people still do that one. <laughs> Fig leaf, I was ashamed, I was naked. Hurt, fear, lust, anger, guilt, shame. Well, the lust got him in the problem in the first place, didn't it? Got him over into that other kingdom, the kingdom of fear. So quite frankly, it's quite easy to literally walk in the spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. You don't have to agonize over this, but you have to know where your spirit is. This is the epicenter. This is conscience. And technically, the, they even teach it now, is the enteric nervous system, which is, and they're calling this gut, the second brain. I'm talking secular. If the secular is smarter, and we have a lot of Christians going to New Age simply because they saw deadness in the church. They didn't see any spiritual reality. Now they can go get demon spirits with new age. <laughs> Excitement. But in reality, God is saying, I put within you a spirit. And the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord. And guess what? It searches all the innermost parts of the belly. Yes, belly. And that is the proper word. And when Jesus said, if anyone come to me and drink out of his belly, will flow rivers of living water. He said, belly. They changed it to heart later. And then, then how many people did we have to get trying to say, Jesus did not come into your blood pumper. He came into your spirit. This is not your spirit. That's your blood pumper. That translation of heart done, probably done more harm than good. There's only one verse that actually applies to this heart in the New Testament, and that's that men's hearts will fail for fear. You could have a heart attack just from, from demonic fear. But anyway, the heart is the innermost being, the hidden man of the heart. Why would it be called the hidden man of the heart if it was the blood pumper all this time? That's not hidden. I know where that's at. So, Father, we just thank you that you who began a good work are going to continue. We're going to do more of this ministry, but um, I can't even begin to get to what I wanted to get to. But if you get the foundation right, we can build. We could start removing the structure and clearing out the landscape, right? We're probably at the place where the Amish were. Before we build and plant and really see the good things take place, right now we got to clear the ground. we got to clear. Root out, pull down. Root out so we can plant. Pull down so we can build. Destroy so we can plant. Got it? Then we can build and plant. So changing the landscape is the word of the Lord that we heard this morning from multiple voices in this congregation. And thus saith the Lord, it's happening and it's happening now. It's God who is at work to will and to perform. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. 
You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life-transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, that's forgive123.com.